and welcome everybody to today's Department of Seminar. Today I'm glad to welcome Ellen Smith from UCL, she's a teaching fellow there, and she'll talk about, um, about language change um, and language contact in, um, on the Bougainville Islands of Papua New Guinea. So, uh, yes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. Um, so, yeah, today I'm going to talk about contact reduced change in Papapana, which is a highly endangered Austronesian language of Papua New Guinea. Um, so, the data for this um, research comes from my PhD project, which I carried out at the University of Newcastle in Australia. Um, it was a documentation project um, where I, had, I created community materials, and then my thesis was a grammatical description. And I also looked at some language contact issues as well. Um, this project was funded by ELDP. Um, I had two fieldwork trips, um, 11 months in total, and I collected about 60 hours of audio and video recordings. Um, some were elicitation sessions, some were um, text. That's all been annotated, and then various other types of data like field notes. So that's the data that this research is based on. Um, the aims of this particular presentation are to look at um, the consequences of language contact in the Papapana community. So first I'll just talk a bit about Papapana and the contact situation, um, and then look at contact-induced change in clause orders, um, obliques and possession, and looking here at contact-induced change due to contact with Papuan languages. Um, then I'll kind of summarise that and look at, a, um, look at related languages and how Papapana shows similar changes to some other related languages and what the implications of that might be. And then finally, I just want to present a little bit of pre preliminary research um, on contact-induced change, but this time looking at the influence of Tok Pisin rather than uh, Papuan languages. Before concluding... Okay, so Papapana is spoken on Bougainville Island, uh, which is up here in Papua New Guinea. Here you can see the top of Australia and Indonesia. Um, it's spoken on the northeast coast. So here's, sorry, that's not very clear on this one. Here's Bougainville Island here. Um, if we zoom in to around about Koi Koi there, and then zoom in even further, you can see Koi Koi at the top, and then some of these other villages. So there's six villages in total. Um, some of them are just small clearings and some of them are spread around rivers or roads or whatever. Um, and in total, there's a population of about 510 people in those six villages. Um, but of those 510 people, only 106, actually now 104 because two have died, uh, 106 are fluent speakers. Um, so Papapana is an Austronesian language. Um, in Papua New Guinea, 27% um, of its languages, it's got about 840 odd languages in Papua New Guinea, um, and 27% are Austronesian and 73% are Papuan. Um, the Austronesian language family um, has about 1,200 languages in it, um, spreading from Madagascar in the east all the way to um, Easter Island, sorry, Madagascar in the west, all the way to Easter Island in the east, and from sort of Hawaii and Taiwan in the north down to New Zealand in the south. Um, there's about 230 million people who speak these languages, um, and Papapan is one of them. Within Austronesian, the Austronesian language family, there's a group, the Oceanic group, and within that, go sort of down the subgroups, um, you get to Northwest Solomonic, which is the group that Papapana belongs to. Um, Oceanic languages are spread across Micronesia, Melanesia and Polynesia, and Bougainville situated in the Melanesian area of the Pacific. Um, the Northwest Solomonic languages are spoken in Bougainville. You can see the ones in pink here are Northwest Solomonic languages, and in the Northwest Solomon Islands. So you can just see the tip here of um, one of the Solomon Islands, and then they go further south. Um, the purple languages here are Papuan languages, so you can see there's quite a lot of diversity just on this one very small island. Um, as I mentioned before, then Pap uh, Papua New Guinea's got 840 languages, which is 13% of the world's population. Um, uh, sorry, 13% of the world's languages, um, and 6 to 7 million people, which is 0.1% of the world's population. So it's got a massive amount of 
um, linguistic diversity. In Bougainville, there's about 20 languages, both Papuan and Northwest Solomonic, um, but only 175,000 people. Um, so multilingualism is the norm in this region. Um, in terms of the Papapana community, before um, white settlement contact was very minimal, um, there was only really contact for trade or intermarriage uh, with Rotica speakers, which you can see here if Papapana is here. The Rotica area completely surrounds the Papapana area. Um, but then when the Europeans settled and introduced missions and schools and started translating the Bible and so on, uh, the Papapana people had contact with English, with Tokpis and, and with other local languages. Um, due to work in plantations, uh, there's a lot of plantations both north and south of the Papapana villages. Um, due to the Papapana speakers working in those plantations and people coming from all over the island to work in them, there was further contact. Um, in the 1990s, there was a big civil war in Bougainville called the Bougainville Crisis. Um, this caused a massive amount of displacement. Um, with people fleeing into the mountains or being placed in uh, care centres. Um, and then there's been a, a certain degree of overpopulation um, and people have sort of their land size decreased for a while but then they became very overpopulated so they had to then spread back out again. Um, and there's been increased travel to population centres for things like work, meetings, markets, church and so on as well as increasing media and technology. So all of these factors here have led to even more contact with Tokpisin and with other local languages. So we've got more contact outside of the community and more intermarriage inside of the community. So if we look at the languages that are spoken within those six villages, we find that um, six of them are Northwest Solomonic languages. Um, Another six are Papuan languages, and another five are languages from various different places in Papua New Guinea. So there's quite a number of different languages represented um, in the villages. Um, in terms of language endangerment, um, Papapana is likely to be one of the world's sort of um, 7,000 7, languages which won't exist in 100 years' time. Um, only 17% of the village population are fluent speakers. There's only two um, child first language speakers, these two boys here. Um, and there is some other transmission, but it's very one way. Children will just reply back in top person. Um, Papapan is used in the home, um, occasionally in church, maybe for the odd song, um, and a little bit in school, but in school, it's a bit tricky because there's only one Papapana speaking teacher. Um, the children are of various ages with different L1 backgrounds. There's temporary materials and it's sort of taught, or well, the lessons I observed anyway, it's taught more as a second language along with English. Um, so the teacher uses top pisin to teach Papapana. Um, and Papapana is sometimes used in maths and science for numbers or naming certain things like plants. Um, so yeah, it's definitely endangered um, and it's endangered because of the shift to Tokpisin as Creole. Um, Tokpisin is a lingua franca both in and outside of the community. Um, it's economically advantageous, literacy is useful, um, whereas Papapan is a small minority language so it's less prestigious and the fact that there's been this increased contact over the last hundred years or so has meant that the speaker numbers have sort of been diluted, as it were, which has possibly weakened their sense of, sense of identity and so on. And also the lack of materials um, doesn't really help either. So that's just kind of a little bit of an introduction as to why the language is endangered. It's endangered because, not because of contact with Papuan languages, but because of contact with Top Pisin. Okay, so... If we look now, one of the other consequences is this contact-induced change, which Hein and Kutvert describe as a linguistic behaviour that differs from that of earlier generations and has been influenced in some way by language contact. And this is a major factor in the development of atypical linguistic features in um, Austronesian languages in the Melanesian area. Um, Ross talks about how we have sort of this sustained bilingualism 
lead speakers to adapt the structures of their emblematic language, so the sort of recipient or re replica language, to the model of the intergroup language, or they speak the intergroup language with the emblematic phonology. Then what can happen is this emblematic um, language sort of survives in its restructured version, and Ross calls this metatypy, which is a change in morphosyntactic type which occurs when speakers are bilingual and restructure the morphosyntactic constructions of one of the languages on the model of constructions from that other language. This is also known elsewhere as uh, grammatical replication, structural borrowing, pattern replication. Um, um, Matras and Sarkal talk about um, pattern replication where you've got patterns of distribution of grammatical and semantic meaning and a formal syntactic arrangement modelled on an external source. And they um, sort of have pattern replication and matter replication where you're replicating the actual form um, and substance, which I'll come on to later on. So in Papapana, um, we find that there's a mixture of right and left-headed structures and the question is, is this evidence of contact-induced change? If we're following Thomason's steps of identifying contact-induced change, first of all, we need to look at the language as a whole, which I've done in my grammar. Um, then we need to identify a source language and identify that there's been intense contact, which I've just described earlier on. So source languages are these Papuan languages, I think, and um, shown that there's been intense contact over time. Uh, particularly with the language Rhoticus, but also with Buin and a language called Matuna, because those speakers would have come up to the Papapana area to work in the plantations. Um, there's a lot more movement around the island now as well. So third step is to identify shared structural features, which I'm saying are a verb final clause orders, postpositions and prepostpossessors. Then we need to prove that those proposed interference features didn't exist in the receiving language in Papapana before contact. But because there's no documentation of Papapana until you know, the last few years, um, I can't do that. We haven't got records of Papapana from over 100 years ago. So instead, we need to examine the canonical oceanic morphosyntactic features that are found in many Northwest Solomonic languages and illustrate how Papapana conforms to or diverges from that canon. And the fifth step is to pro uh, prove that these interference features were present in the source language before contact. And again, that's quite difficult because we haven't got records of Papuan languages from 100 or so years ago. But if we look at the constructions in the North Bougainville language, Rhoticus, and in the South Bougainville languages, Buin and Matuna, constructions that are similar between those languages, um, we can sort of take those as typical of the Papuan languages of that region. And these languages are considered part of the East Papuan film, even though the North and South Bougainville languages, we're not sure if they're you know, completely related. Okay, so looking at clause orders first. In Northwest Solomonic languages, the pragmatically unmarked clause order is verb initial, um, but the order of the postverbal subject and object varies. So we could have VSO order or VOS order. There's a pre-verbal argument position for pragmatically marked arguments, which is called T, and that might be the topic or it might be the focus. Um, and then we end up with this pragmatically marked order of TVX, where T is the pragmatically marked argument and X is the unmarked argument. So if we look at Benoni, which is spoken in the West, um, we can see here that this um, third person singular pronoun is the topic in the first line there, so he killed a pig, and we have this um, TVX order. But then in the second line, because this third person singular is no longer the topic, it occurs post-verbally, and we have V-O-S order. Okay, so that's in Benoni. In Teot, um, another Northwest Solomonic language, uh, the clause in this topic is obligatory, um, and that means that all clauses are verb medial. So there is some variation between Northwest Solomonic languages. But regardless of whether the, option, uh, the topic is optional um, or obligatory, the verb always precedes unmarked arguments. In Papapana, however, we have a bit of variation. We've got 
SOV and SVO orders, and they, these are the pragmatically unmarked clause orders. I tried my hardest to find some kind of pattern to explain this, but there just isn't one. These orders occur across a variety of genres, a range of speakers, and there's no grammatical motivation or markers. It's just variation. Um, so in two, you can see we've got the SVO order. So he refused his brother, his big brother. And in the second one, we've got the... Um, SOV order, we've got you, my wife, maybe you don't like her. Okay. The pragmatically marked clause order in Papapani, you've got this initial topic. So, of course, if the subject is topic, we end up with the same orders. We have either SOV or SVO. Uh, but if the object is topic, we've got OSV order, as we do here. So, us, um, nobody saw us. So we've got the SVO order, which is a bit like Northwest Solomonic, but where does this SOV order come from? Because that's definitely not Northwest Solomonic. So if we look at the Papuan languages, we find that SOV is the basic clause order, um, although it is possible to have post-verbal argument in some languages. So in Rotticus, we've got this uh, verb final SOV order, as in number five. Um, we can also have OVS and SVO under certain conditions. Um, then in Buin, we've got um, SOV as preferred order. Again, we can have OSV dependent, but that's something to do with the animus, animacy hierarchy. Uh, but if both arguments are equal in animacy, we've got SOV. Okay, so SOV, basic clause order for both of these languages. And similarly with Motuna, we've got, well, with Motuna, there's a lot of variation, but SOV is the most frequent and the least pragmatically marked, as in number seven here. Um, and then Nagavisi, limited data, but again, it shows verb final clause order. And in Nasioi, again, it's usually SOV, um, basic clause order. So perhaps that's why we've got SOV order in Papana. Okay, moving on to obliques then. So in Northwest Solomonic languages, oblique arguments and adjuncts are expressed with prepositions, and there's a small number of them which introduce participants with a wide range of semantic roles. For example, in Benoni, we've got these three here. So mo, expressing location, goal, source, ganai for instrument, and ma or me for um, accompaniment. And this shows uh, this one here. So I shall go with bano, but mea bano with the preposition followed by the noun phrase. Okay, so that's typical Northwest Solomonic. And in Papapana, we've got prepositions as well. We've got te, um, which can mark uh, location, either in space or time. It can mark uh, goal, it can mark source, instrument, possession. So in uh, nine, we've got um, goal with this one. And in 10, you can see instrument with tena torara, so you cut the tree with an ax. Um, then we've got this weird one, which I'm going to come back later, which is not a, a very typical preposition um, in uh, North Oceanic oh, well, no languages. Iang uh, Oyena, and this means until. So we've got here, Aya Eputui, Iang Oyena Natui. So he will sleep till tomorrow. This can only occur with a certain um, number of these location nouns, like tomorrow or Friday or something like that. Um, Okay, so, so far, that's typical of North West Solomonic. We've got two prepositions, and they, you know, there's a small number of them, and they introduce participants with a wide range of semantic roles. So that's typical. But then we've got this postposition to mana, which expresses uh, accompaniment, as in number 12. So we've got Sibuava Nani Siasina Seda O Tomana. We left the old women there with an old man. And this isn't typical to have a postposition. This postposition is also a bit strange because it occurs between the head noun and then if you've got um, a possessive uh, prepositional phrase like teaya, or if you've got a relative clause, the, this possessive prepositional phrase and relative clauses always come after the noun. Um, but you would expect tomana to occur outside of that noun phrase. So you'd have naba o kaka o teaya tomana, but it doesn't. Instead, it occurs between the head noun and these um, post modifiers. 
But there's only a few examples of this, and usually speakers use another construction, um, this applicative commutative construction, which is, I can't get into today. Um, so only a few examples, but it shows that it's occurring not where we'd expect it to occur. So it's, in, it's syntactically inside the noun phrase, and it's not the head of a postpositional phrase, which suggests it's not a fully fledged postposition yet. Possibly, it's grammaticalized as a commutative marker from the additive marker too. So we've got this example here, Nascuru Tomana Ye Somunuera. So the school where we're sitting too, and then he continued with the sentence. Um, so here we've got the head noun, and then we've got a relative clause, and we can see that the two is in the middle here, which follows this same pattern. Okay, so possibly this tomana is actually grammaticalized from the additive marker too. The question is, is this evidence of lexical calcing? So lexical calcing is where the meaning range of a lexical item in the replica language is matched to the meaning range of the item in the model language until the two vocabularies are read readily intertranslatable. So let's have a look and see at, uh, what the Papuan languages do. So in Papuan languages, as we might expect, um, given they've got verb final clause order, um, obliques are expressed by case enclitics and postpositions and case suffixes. So uh, Rotticus here shows you um, an example of a case enclitic. Sorry, that should be the equal sign there. Um, and then we've also got a postposition in this one here. Um, but if we have a look at Rotticus, the postpositions in Rotticus, we also find we've got this, um, this one here, Taporo, or Tapo, which um, Robinson glosses as also to and with. But he, in the data examples, Robinson always glosses it as also. But um, it's often found introducing adjunct noun phrases, and Robinson describes it as an oblique marker. So in this example, it's translated as with. Um, so Riva Siri always wants to play with the other children. So possibly what we've got here is we've got this taporo in um, Rosicus, meaning to and also meaning with. And then we've had lexical calking in Papapana, where the sort of meaning of tomana has been extended from to to uh, to a uh, commutative marker under the under sort of the Papuan model. Um, these examples here just show you the case suffixes in Buin and in Motuna, and then in Nagovisi and Nasuri we've got case suffixes and postpositions respectively. So Papuan languages have all got sort of case enclitics or suffixes or postpositions, whereas the Northwest Solomon languages don't. Okay, moving on then to possession. There's two constructions we have to talk about in Northwest Solomonic languages. The first is the direct construction, and this is used for nouns which are inalienable, so body parts, locative parts, and kin terms. And you get the possessum, so the possessed noun has a possessor suffix attached to it. And if there is um, a possessor noun phrase, it will always occur, it will always be post post, it will always be after the possessor. But it doesn't have to be there. So, for example, here in um, Benoni, we've got um, Numana, meaning his hand, and then we've got Ken there. So, we could just say Numana, meaning his hand, or we could say Numana Ken, meaning Ken's hand. Okay. I guess when it's something like my hand, it's less need to add the pronoun there. Um, but it's this optional, optional possessor MP will always occur after the possessor. The other construction in Northwest Solomonic languages is the indirect construction, and this is used for aliable nouns. So that's all other nouns, removable body parts, um, kin that have been acquired through marriage. Um, and this construction is a, a bit more complicated. We've got a particle or some kind of possessive classifier, usually for consumable or non-consumable or general possession. And then that classifier or particle has a possessor suffix added to it. And then that whole construction, which would be like this here in uh, Kubakota, 
that whole construction precedes the possessum, um, the possess noun. And then if we have uh, a possess noun phrase, again, that will be post-post. So um, in Kubrakosa, we can see the uh, consumable possessive classifier followed by the possessor suffix, and then the possessor, but there's no possessor MP in that one. Um, in Roviana, we can see that, as is often the case in Northwest Sonronic languages, the possessive particle is not synchronically segmentable. So here we just have nana, and we can't split it up into a classifier and the suffix. Um, the Roviano example also shows that if we do have a possessor MP, um, that will follow the noun here. So here we've got uh, TAOE, that person. Um, okay, so those are the Northwest Solomonic constructions. The Papapana one for direct, construct, uh, direct possession um, is used also for inalienable nouns. There's a variation as to which nouns are considered inalienable and alienable. So in Papapana, inalienable nouns are body parts, some bodily products, locative parts, and some kin terms, but not all kin terms. Um, the construction is exactly like the Northwest Solomonic one, where you get a possessor suffix attaching to the possessor. Okay, so in fact, it would be exactly the same as Benoni for hand, no manner. Okay. Um, but the difference is that if you have got a possessor noun phrase, it can either be preposed, as in 24, so nainu namatana, the house's door, or it can be postposed, as in 23, etamana nusia. Okay, so that shows some variation there, which we, I mean, this one obviously is like the Northwest Solomonic pattern, but this one isn't. The indirect construction marks alienable nouns, which is basically all other nouns that aren't inalienable. Um, and for this construction, we have a possessor proclitic attaching usually to the, well, depending on the noun class, it might attach to the possessor or to some other sort of um, pre-modifier. So there's no classifiers in Papapana. There's no distinction between consumable, non-consumable, or anything like that. Um, and these possessor proclitics or possessor particles um, are not segmentable into a possessive constituent and a suffix in the same way that we could do it with Kubakuta. They don't co-occur with specific and non-specific articles. So what that means is that if there's no other... Um, there's no other article or numeral modifier or anything before the noun, then what happens is this proclitic attaches to the head noun. But only if we've got the class one, no, so we've got three, four noun classes, we've got personal noun class, and all the personal nouns are directly possessed, so we don't need to worry about them. And then we've got class one and class two, and then um, location nouns. So we've got a class one noun, and it's singular, the possessor proclitic attaches directly to the head noun, as in this example here. So that's a bit strange, because then that means it's actually direct and head marking. But if it's a class two noun, like usia, we find that the possessor proclitic attaches to this marker al, so we get amiel, um, amiel usia. So we've got our teacher and our child there. If there was some other article there, like this one here, this uh, plural article, it would attach to the plural article. So we'd get ami bao or ena bao adope isio. Um, okay, what was I going to say? Because of this, we, have, we find that the possessum number is always marked and the um, possessum class is marked in the singular. So from this construction, we can tell um, not just the number, but also the noun class of the possessor. The other thing, important thing, is like the direct construction, we have variation in the pre-posed and post-posed, let's call, um, possessor noun phrases. So in this one here, in 26, we've got Anna al sinoni, so my husband, and we've got this uh, pre-posed possessor MP, whereas in this one, we've got Enabo Adopeisio and the Possess MP is post post, which is typical of Northwest Solomonic. But 26 isn't typical. 
So let's see what, um, oh, one more thing about um, Papapana then. So then the, we also have um, the possessive pronoun paradigm, and this paradigm marks noun class. So possessive pronouns can function as noun phrase arguments or as noun phrase predicates. Um, if the possessive referent is singular and class one, the pronoun consists of the possessor proclitic, au, in this case, followed by ata, so we have au ata. But if the possessor referent is class two, we have um, possessor proclitic and au, so we get ami au. And so then that just looks exactly like um, this one here. Okay? But for the class one, we don't get ami ata va mama matau like that. So it's almost a bit like we've got these possessive pronouns and they're the same as the possessor particles that go before the possessor, except if it's class one where this ata kind of gets knocked off and what's remaining just attaches directly to the possessor. Um, if the possessor referent is plural, then the pronoun consists of the proclitic and bao. So we've got ami bao as we did uh, a bit like here with enabal. So one thing I'm wondering here is whether or not we've got evidence of grammatical calcing where we've got changes in the semantic divisions of grammatical categories because we don't have classifiers anymore um, in Papapana, whereas a lot of Northwest Solomonic languages do have uh, possessive classifiers. And so we've lost that distinction but gained this distinction of marking noun class in these um, possessive pronouns, which is unusual. Looking at the um, uh, Papuan languages, their possessors are preposed, so presumably that's where Papapana gets its preposed possessors from. So in Rotticus, um, we have indirect constructions with three constructions, um, and in this one, these two, we've got uh, preposed possessors. Um, this one here is the most common, where we've got uh, the possessor followed by the possessum, and then this uh, possessive marker here and shows it in this example, 31. In Buin, we've got direct and indirect constructions. Um, it, in both of them, the possessor um, is preposed. So here it's attached directly to the possessor and here to um, this genitive marker. And in Motuna, we've got a variety of constructions as well, but mostly the possessor precedes the possessum. And in Nagovisi and Nasioi, we've got two constructions. And again, if you've got a possessor MP, it will be preposed. So, Rotticus, um, so we've got these preposed possessors if we've got a, um, a possessor MP. Um, but then we also find that Rotticus and Motuna, the, um, their possessor noun class is marked by a pronoun or a classifier. So, in Rotticus here, um, this dummy pronoun agrees with the possessor. Um, in, number and, sorry, in gender, oh, sorry, Robertson calls it gender, but noun class. So this dummy pronoun agrees with the possessive noun class. Um, and similarly in Motuna, um, we have this pronoun here um, marks the possessive noun class. And then in Nagovisi and Nasioi, the possessive number is marked by the possessive um, particle. Okay, so here this possessive particle has the possessive um, number marked on it. So this is a little bit like Papapana where the number and noun class of the possessive is marked. So to summarise then, the clause order in Papapana, the SVO clause order is typical of Northwest Solomonic and Oceanic languages, but the SOV order isn't typical and instead the SOV order is, is like the Papuan um, clause orders. In obliques, the prepositions, the two prepositions in Papapana are typically Northwest Solomonic, but the postposition isn't, and instead the postposition um, is more like the Papuan postpositions. And we also get this situation where Tomana has probably grammaticalized as a postposition um, under the influence of Rotticus. Then in possession, we've got um, the postposed possessor MP is typical of Northwest Solomonic but the preposed possessors typical of Papuan languages. 
the direct construction is perfectly typical in both form and semantics, but the indirect construction in Papapana differs somewhat from the canonical oceanic structure because the proclitics are not independent particles sometimes, they're not segmentable. Um, Papapana is like Papuan languages because there's no classifiers and it's like Rotticus and Motuna because it's marked for noun class when they possess some singular. So if we look outside of Papapana now to some related languages, we can see that these changes are similar to those found in the Papuan tip linkage um, in southern New Guinea, um, in Takia, in northern New Guinea. Um, and also in Mono, Torao and Uruava, which are Northwest Solomonic languages. So Torao spoken just south of the coast, south along the coast um, from Papapana. Mono spoken, if I go back up to the um, map up here, I can show you. Okay, so Mono Alu is spoken here. Um, and then we've got Torao here. And Uruava was spoken here, but it's now extinct. So um, Evans and Palmer carried out some research into these languages um, and found similar kinds of changes. So in Uruava, Mono and Tora, we've got SOV order um, and some other orders as well, but the unmarked order is SOV. In these three languages, we've got a mixture of prepositions and postpositions as well, um, which is like Papapana, but there's some differences to Papapana because uh, ablative is marked differently, whereas in Papapana, locative, allative, and ablative are all the same. There's adposition stacking in Uruava and Monu under the influence of Nagovisi, and there's an optional allative in, Na in uh, Uruava under the influence of Nasioi. So they've got some things in common in terms of their contact induced changes, but some things um, are a bit different. And possession, um, there's no classifiers in all four of the languages. Um, then in Uruava, Monu and Tora, we've got preposed possessor noun phrases, but in Papapana we have a mixture. Um, Papapana marks the noun class of the possessor if it's singular. Um, Uruava marks the plur uh, plurality for possessums, and Tora marks um, possessum as being singular. So there's some similarities and there's some differences there. But we can see that Papaban has a lot more mixture and it's a bit more conservative. It's retained some of the Northwest Solomonic features more so than the other three languages. So is this a common change or is it an independent change? If it's a common change, we could have um, so shared innovations of a common ancestor, which might suggest, uh, sort of be evidence for internal subgrouping. So Papapana is actually in Ross's 1988 paper, he placed Papapana um, in this group here, the Nahan North Bougainville subgroup, um, which includes the languages of Northern Bougainville and Booker Island, just at the top. But um, Bill Palmer's recently found some sort of similarities in lexicon and syntax, which raise the possibility that actually Papapana is related more closely to Uruava, which is here, um, and Mono, and possibly even Mono and Torao. And I think the sort of similarities in contact induced chromatical change kind of provide further support for that um, hypothesis. The other idea is that these are actually independent changes that parallel other oceanic languages whose speakers have or had contact with speakers of typologically similar Papuan languages. So in the Papuan tip and um, Taka languages, they also have verb final clause order, postpositions, and pre post possessors. Okay, and then we can't say that they're in the same subgroup. They're definitely not all Northwest, Solom uh, Northwest Solomonic. Um, so perhaps also the differences that we saw between Papapana, Mono, Tora, and Uruava might suggest that the languages have independently undergone metatipi on the model of languages belonging to the same linguistic area. And indeed, postpositions and preposed possessors correlate. Uh, with verb final clause orders cross-linguistically. So possibly what's happened is we've got pap on contact, which has led to verb final clause orders in Papapana and in Monotora and Ruava. And then that change has led to related shifts, reaching different degrees of completion in each language. The other idea is that it's a mixture of both. 
Okay, and that's in fact what Evans and Palmer argue that um, the similarities and differences in Monotoro and Uava show a history of interrelated changes, some of which are likely to have occurred before the breakup of the ancestral speech community and others that occurred independently. And this might account for why Papapana displays more of a mix of left and right headed typology. So possibly Papapana split off from the common ancestor at a point when that change from left to right headed structures hadn't it wasn't complete. Further evidence for that is um, some of the speakers were telling me how um, they had come up, they'd migrated up from the Solomon Islands, sort of in the early 1900s. Um, it got up all the way up to where Tepori is, where the main village is, Papapana village. And then after that, other speakers moved back down south again. So possibly they've all kind of all come up together when they are all one group. Um, and that change hasn't yet been completed. And then because of then the split in the migration and people moving further south, the Papapana people have been sort of left behind and developed in their own way. So in this community, um, possibly this shift hasn't reached the same degree of completion. Perhaps it was halted or perhaps it was reversed because then what happened in the Papapana community was um, other tribes came down from the north of Bougainville, from sort of like the Teop speaking areas, um, which are northwest Solomonic languages, and joined the, joined the villages, which possibly meant that that change that was occurring perhaps got reversed back in the direction of northwest Solomonic, uh, the northwest Solomonic pattern. Or it could be that it did reach this degree, same degree of completion, but because of the recent shift to top pissin, which is SVO order and left-headed, there's been further contact-induced change more recently, perhaps back in the direction of this sort of canonical oceanic pattern. Okay, so since we're talking about top pissin there, we might wonder, all right, so there's been contact with Papuan languages historically over time, and that's led to contact-induced change, but it hasn't led to language shift. But then the contact with Tok Pisin has led to language shift. So surely, you know, has there, there must have been some kind of um, linguistic changes as well, or we might expect there to be. So let's have a look. So earlier on I mentioned this preposition, Iang or Yena, and basically, it's just a bit too morphologically complex to be um, a preposition, in a typical Northwest Solomonic preposition. Um, so I'm wondering with this Iang Oyena whether it shows evidence of lexical calcing under the influence of top pisin. So lexical calcing is where the meaning range of a lexical item in the replica language is matched to the meaning range of the item in the model language until the two vocabularies are intertranslatable. So I think that this preposition has likely been lexicalized, um, uh, likely to be a lexicalized form of the modal verb iangoi and the third person singular postverbal subject indexing in clitic ena. Okay, so iangoi is a verb meaning be able and it occurs inside of what's called a verb complex. Um, so that's basically the verb along with participant reference markers and tense aspect mood and so on. But doesn't include the arguments themselves. So Iang or Yinkers, inside of this verb uh, complex with these post-verbal subject indexing eucalytics like this, and it requires a clausal complement. Okay, so here we've got this complement on now wakonai, ani or yang or omo on now wakonai. Post-verbal subject indexing clitic here is second person singular, which is matches our subject and our subject um, marker here as well. Also, iangoi is a lexicalized clause level adverb um, indicating ability. So this time we've got iangoi and then we've got ena, which is usually the third person singular. So if, um, here, if it was aya, third person singular, we'd have iangoiena there. So this iangoiena has sort of been lexicalized as an adverb. So we've got jerry, iangoiena, so Jerry can attack the pig, and this occurs outside of this verb complex here. But then we've also got yang or yena as that preposition I mentioned earlier on, meaning until. If we have a look at top pisin, we find this word inap is also a verb expressing ability. 
So as in doki no bin ina long kissim him, so the dog wasn't able to get him. Or oli no ina win long mipela, they're not able to beat us. Um, and ina is a preposition denoting until, as in 37, emigo ina long Friday. So possibly what's happened in Papapana is this word iang, iang oi or iang o yena, which means be able, has then been, its meaning has been extended to this preposition until under the influence here of top pissing. Because we don't find this in other Northwest Solomonic languages. Um, also, possibly there's evidence of let's call Kelking with this complementizer of Vossia. Vossia introduces finite clauses licensed by desiderative or propositional attitude or knowledge verbs like dislike, think, and know. Um, we get reason adverbial clauses introduced by um, avisi, meaning because, but also they can be introduced by avosia. Similarly, with purpose adverbial clauses, they're introduced with tanawa, which means so that, but they can also be introduced by avosia, as in this one here. Avosia tausi papasi nurisi mereo obutu, so they said come paddle, and then they mean so that the canoe rope breaks quickly. So Avosia is becoming sort of more of a general subordinator, perhaps when people can't re actually recall the specific subordinator. So in sort of text um, recordings where people are just sort of freely telling stories, they'll often just use Avosia. And it took a fair bit of elicitation sometimes to get these other words to come out. They weren't, Avisi and Tanawa weren't that common. So possibly Avosia is sort of just taking over as this general subordinator because of the fact that this language is dying out and people are um, forgetting some things. Or it could be under the influence of Top Pisson where the subordinator also has quite a range of meanings like like, this way, thus, therefore and so. We also find um, a lot of matter replication. So that's direct replication of morphemes and phonological shapes from a source language. So it's the formal substance or matter. So previously I've been talking about pattern replication and now this is matter replication. Um, the question is, is this propagated or on the spot loans? So sometimes we find that the top pissing word is used when there isn't a Papapana equivalent, perhaps because it's some kind of foreign concept like um, army or playing cards. So top pissing is used there, which I think is not perfectly common in the world's languages. This happens all the time. Um, so here we've got bao army for uh, the army. We've got pirai kata for play cards. And then we've got kiki here for kick. Sometimes this is adapted phonologically. So in top pisson, it's actually kick, pili, and cat. Okay, so it's been adapted to the Papapana phonology where um, syllables are always open. And where, for example, there's no l, l phoneme in um, Papapana. So they've got r there instead. Um, sometimes the speaker just sort of mixes them. So in this example here, um, they've got so six, six pella, which is top person, six pella or tawita, so six pella, how many? And then they use the top, uh, the papapana first and then switch to the top person. So there's no way here that we can say that they've used the top person because there isn't a papapana equivalent because they've used the papapana on first, na aria and nanga nanga, one month, and then they've said it in top person, one pella moon. And the... And some other examples, we find the opposite, where the top person ones use first, perhaps because they're trying to recall the Papapana one. And this one comes from a speaker who was not particularly, um, not as fluent as others. So she says, Anau Noel twins, Awami Noel, and she keeps repeating herself, Awami Noel, and then eventually she gets to the Papapana word, Tapo, meaning twin. So... One of the things I want to look at um, in sort of my research at the moment is which let's call domains are the most affected um, by this matter replication. How phonologically integrated are some of these top piss and loans? Is there any variation according to gender or age or proficiency? 
Is there any variation amongst tech genres? Um, and also this idea, sort of question of whether sometimes we end up with um, English loans and are those direct from English or are they direct from top pissing? Because more and more people are speaking English now um, in the towns. Um, children are learning it from a much earlier age in school. So it's hard to know then sometimes, has it come directly from English or has it come from English via top pissing as top pissing gets um, more and more uh, sort of decreolized. Okay, so in conclusion then, the, que the main question was, uh, what are the consequences of um, you know, language contact in the, this community? What, is there evidence of contact reduced language change? I think we can say yes, there definitely is. We find pattern replication, so we've got this metatippy that Ross describes, uh, in his words, metatippy. We've got right-headed structures, um, are not typical of North West Solomonic languages, but they resemble Papuan languages. We've got evidence of lexical calcing with this postposition tomana, which is grammaticalized from the additive marker two. And it's got the same meaning range as roticus um, tapo or taporo. We've also got lexical calcing under the influence of top pisin with iang oyena. Um, and then we've got grammatical calcing because we've had uh, a neutralization of classes of indirect possessor relations and this introduced possessive noun class distinction. And these things resemble Papuan languages. And on top of that, we've also got matter replication. So there's many top Pisin and English lexemes used, um, and some are more phonologically integrated than others. The question is, are they propagated or are they on the spot? Um, so we can say that uh, given the degree of contact with Papuan languages and with top Pisin, I think these changes all are all due to contact. Papuan languages have influenced morphosyntax and some semantics. Um, top Pisin has influenced language use considerably, causing language endangerment, but it's also influenced um, the semantics and the lexicon. And the other implication of these findings is that the similarities um, in contact-induced changes between Papapana and Monotora and Luwava suggest that they've got more of a shared history than the sort of current subgrouping um, suggests. But can the mixture be attributed to shift back in the direction of left-headed um, uh, typology due to top pissins? So we've got these similarities that suggest a shared history, but Papapana obviously shows much more of a mixture between left and right-headed typology. Why is that? Is it because the Papapana group sort of was split off at an earlier stage, or is it because um, top pissin has actually sort of uh, influenced um, the morphosyntax more um, than it seems. But it's really hard to tell that because the top pissin is also left-headed. So if we have had this shift back in the direction of left-headed, it's hard to know if that's due to top pissin or if it, whether that was just there all along. Thank you very much, Matana. <laughs> Any questions? Um, did you look at the, uh, like the, the linguistic repertoire of people in the village? Did you, did you document that in any way? Yes, I did. So when I, particularly when I was looking at the clause orders, I was look, tried to see if if there's any correlation between, for example, SOV clause order and the speaker's linguistic repertoire. So some of the speakers spoke Roticus, for example. Did that mean that if we had a speaker that spoke Papapan and Roticus, did, are they, were they more likely to use SOV clause orders or not? And there wasn't any sort of pattern there. I would, it would have been nice if sort of the ones that spoke Papuan languages were the ones that produced the SOV clauders, but it wasn't the case. So you had speakers who didn't speak Papuan languages, and they also produced SOV clause orders. This is really nice talk. Thank you for the, for the really clear presentation. Oh, thank you. I think we always have to keep in mind that it's not languages that are in contact, but it's yeah. people who are in contact. Yeah. Not only looking at repertoires, 
but also looking at personal histories, marriage patterns, yeah. ideologies about, you know, it may be that the Papapana are more ideologically conservative than mm. these other guys. So yeah. you don't have to start talking about shifts back and forth. Degrees of shift or change can actually be influenced by mm. ideologies about conservatism yeah. and so on. And making up complex systems of, you know, this group migrated and then they split and all this. Mm. That's one possible story, but there may be another story which is actually has to do with transmission and, mm -hmm. and language use and, and political views on language and so on. Yeah. So I go, did back, go back and do a full ethnography. Well, I did, um, I did do quite a considerable amount of, of that research, and that's, but I didn't have time to get into all of that today, but I basically mapped uh, sort of the family trees of all 500 people, figured out how they're all linked up together. And that kind of started out because I was trying to figure out how many speakers are there. But you can't just go from like hut to hut and say, how many of you speak Papapana? Because there'd be some people up in the gardens or some people in town or some people away in the city or something. So I was like, I'm never going to be able to go and knock on every, you can't knock on every door and count the speakers because it changes every day. So then I started trying to like draw their family trees and I just ended up in this massive thing where I basically figured out how about 500 people were related, who was married to who, who spoke which languages, what their kids spoke. Um, so yeah, I did, I did look at that as well. Um, That's and that, based on what they told you that they spoke or based on your observations? But a bit of both, yeah. Okay. But sometimes based on my observations and sometimes based on their observations yeah. of either themselves or of each other. Okay. Um, yeah, because I couldn't meet all that, 500 people. That's exactly people. the kind of sort of stuff that really needs to be there to support the, mm. the more yeah. structural stories. Yeah, and that's why when I was trying to figure out why, why is there this variation, and I had then got all of that data there where I could go and look at a speaker and then look at their family, like hey, who they married, not only what do they speak, right which is data that you collect anyway when you record a speaker, but yeah. also who are they married to and who were their parents and you know, things like, or who are their children married to and so on. So, Fantastic. Yeah. I, I think in addition to that, there's also, you know, who do they speak, the fish you know, kind of questions, who do they speak what language to, when, mm. where, so so Milroy network so kind of stuff networks, as well. Yeah. yeah. I think mostly they all, from what I observed, just use top pissing most of the time. And then Papa Pana, if, if there was a group of people speaking and there was nobody else there who spoke, uh, if, nobody, if they all spoke Papa Pana, then they'd use that. But then if I was there, then they'd sometimes just mm -hmm. then switch to top pissing because I was there as well. Um, but yeah, I think even in meetings, they, sorry? Yeah, exactly. But. Um, I think generally they just all use top pissing because there's just, I guess, more likely that there's going to be somebody there that doesn't speak top, uh, doesn't speak Papapana because only 17% of the population speak it, then most of the time there's going to be someone there that doesn't speak it. So, yeah, well, that's and that, why it's. And that is also to do with societal attitudes about, about you know, not speaking. Yeah, well, that kind of all links into another presentation for another day about why is it endangered and, <laughs> and what do they think of the language and so on. Yeah. yeah, and perhaps, I mean, as Peter was saying about the, them being conservative to do with ideology, it's a bit conflicting with their ideology because on the one hand they talk about how Papa Pan is really important, part of their culture, you're not really a Papa Pan person unless you speak the language. Mm -hmm. But then on th their actual linguistic behavior and practice doesn't reflect that attitude. Um, and, then to, uh, and then with top pissing, they talk about how terrible top pissing is, how it's just bad English, how it's a rubbish language. But then, oh, but it's really useful, and they use it all the time. So what they say and what they do are just completely different. But that's a synchronic account. You don't know what it was 500 years ago. Yeah. No. No, I uh, think... Yeah. Oh, I didn't, didn't hear what you said. So I, I see. I, I have a question to follow on from that one. But if, if you have oh, 500 years ago, I think they were still down in the Solomons, um, and then I think when they did move up to where they are now, um, 
I think, yeah, if there was, well, there was multilingualism, but with the Papua languages. Mm. And this is the thing, well, they... Why did they move from the Solomon, sorry? Sorry? Why did they move from the Solomon? That was my question, when, when did all this happen? Uh, yeah. I think, like, late 1800s, groups moved up, and there was some kind of fight with some chief or something like that. There's different accounts of why they moved, but I'm pretty sure the Papa Pana came up with the Torao and Oruava speakers. And there's also, when I said about the um, tribes coming down from the north, I kind of got that idea from things that people had said and how, oh, these tribes came, you know, they named the tribes and these ones joined us later. But I've also got photographs from the 30s and the caption read something um, like, oh, the huts on the right show um, the northern, you know, style of huts, and the huts on the left show the southern style. So there's also this evidence that there had been, sort of in the early 1900s, a mixture of two tribes. Is, is that a papapana gathering you're showing us in this picture here? Uh, no, there's not that many speakers. This is one of the gatherings at um, a local, not mission station, it's a place called Wakunai. It's like one of the. There's an airstrip there and a couple of shops and, you know, like uh, so, little so nurses' how many stations. Which would you guess we are looking at when we look at this crowd? Um, definitely Rotakus. There'd be Papapana speakers there. Uh, half a dozen or something like that. Because this, this particular picture was taken. Um, it was a gathering of all the schools, I think. Sorry, this was like years ago, this picture, so I'm trying to remember. It was, the picture was taken just here at the, around in this oh, area. Papa so I'd Papa imagine there'd be like Papapana, Roticus, possibly Teop speakers, um, maybe some Toral speakers. So it was kind of the schools in that, that sort of district there. Do, do the Papapana people all basically know each other? Or are they likely to meet strangers and not know which language to use? No, they all know each other. Right, so it's like that. Yeah, I think, yeah, they all don't know each other, or they'd know of each other. There's and only they, like a hundred of them, would so... Would they be typically able to um, produce something like that as a sketch map themselves? How much knowledge is there of the, of the situation as you depict it there? Um, a sketch map of what, of the... Well, what, which people are where? And whether you know them as which language? Um, I don't know, actually. That's an interesting question. Probably not. Well, they probably have like a vague idea, like they've got their six villages and they're spread out there and then they probably know that, you know, so-and-so's great niece works as a nurse in town or something like that. But they definitely haven't got any records of who's where or anything. Because only few of them can write. So they might have... Yeah. I, I just sort of interested in how much the structure that you, you're showing that is a sort of artifact of the people coming in and saying, ah, oh, now we see what we're doing. How much it is actually a, a political reality um, mm. in the world. I mean, it's, it's not a world I'm familiar with at all, but it's, I'm quite, it's finding it quite difficult to, to get what a grip on that picture. You know? Well, yeah, I mean, what, what it's somebody's imagination about something. Yes, that's right. Whether it's a shared one. Whereas if, if, you, if you saw a map of, I don't know, the counties of England, mm -hmm. by and large, know where they are and what they are, and they know where they fit within them. Um, <laughs> no, not really, I don't think... <laughs> no, that, no I, I don't know. think they really would. Like, they know they're on... You know, that Surrey's in the south and Essex is in the east. Yeah, no, I right. don't think that they would know it. Because, well, they definitely don't have anything. They don't have... Books. They don't have but paper. What is, what's this supposed to be anyway? Because nobody lives in these. These are not delineated places where people live, right? What this where map here? Town? Yeah. Where is, where is town? I need to go to the other maps to show you. So these, this map here is showing the language areas. When? So now. Sorry? Well, this one's from 2011, so this one's pretty recent. This is from Robinson's Grammar. So this is showing uh, where the different Northwest Solomonic languages and Papuan languages are located. So say if you took the Rotticus area here, 
I don't, I mean, there's definitely, I think you get speakers all around this area, but it's not necessarily that every inch of that area has a speaker in it because it's a mountainous area. But you'd probably get some of them over here and around here dotted around in this area, but it's not going to be fully concentrate, you know, every inch of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not like it's not like in this area. You've only got Rotica speakers. You're going to have maybe, or potentially, Papa Panna speakers have married in, or people have come up from Buin and they've met, or people have gone to town, they've met there, they got married, and then they've moved back to that area. So it's not all of these language areas are going to have language contact mixture in them because people marrying so in and out. The question is, what do you mean by language area? <laughs> It's, yeah. an, it's an imagined area. It's a yeah, I guess it's some so. kind of political, yeah. ideological, di or you know. Area. Yeah, I guess defined. these areas are showing where the language originates, which area the language originates from. Well, except you just said that Papa Panna and the others don't originate there at all. So. <sighs> True. <laughs> but so it's not your fault, Robinson. <laughs> no, it's just a whole problem that I guess Nick is pointing to as well, which is these maps are pretty fictional in many ways. Yeah. I think, yeah. say with Buin, you what it's trying to show I is that the Buin speakers originated in this area and that the most dominant language in this area is Buin. Okay. Papapana, I think, when I'm saying it's come down from this area here and moved up, well, that's their ancestral language. The ancestral group has moved up all the way up here, and then the, a group of people have got left behind, and that, their language has then developed into Papa Pana. And then the other people have moved down, and their sort of ancestral language has developed into Torao and then into Uruaba. And I'm not saying that when they lived down here, they spoke Papa Pana. What I'm trying to say, when they lived down here, they all spoke one language, they've moved up. And after they got split up, their language has developed into three different languages. Um, but yeah, as in the Papapana area here, there's, there's a lot of language mixture in the Papapana villages, as I've shown before. Um, lots of intermarriage and what there was about 18 different local languages represented in just those six villages. So I think you'd get the same situation all over Bougainville, but perhaps not to the same degree, because, say, in some of the Rotticus villages nearby, pretty much the whole village spoke Rotticus as their first language. And yes, they might be multilingual, or there might be people that have married in, but most people would speak Rotticus as their first language. The Papapana villages, it's not, that's not really the case, because Papapana is so endangered. Um, I just, I just, I well, thank you very much for your talk. It's very interesting. And I've been involved in a project looking at languages in the Solomon Islands. And in fact, we intended to describe language contact phenomena. But we find that it's maybe just as difficult as it is for you. Because uh, with not having access to uh, historical data, if you want, uh, yes. or, or only partial, mm -hmm. It's very difficult, in fact, to establish who influences mm. who in these areas where people are uh, very multilingual, but also where the history of, of movements and so on mm -hmm. is so is so int complicated. Yeah. Um, so I think I think uh, you, you, your description of the changes uh, certainly I, I can't comment very much on the on the obliques, but what we've looked at the uh, word order. Uh, seems to correlate with what mm. we found with languages like Gela. Yeah. And I did think about that with, say, like with that um, post position to Mana. Okay, maybe the influence, maybe that's what Papa Panna's always done, and Rotticus has been influenced by Papa Panna. Yeah. How do you know? Well, I guess I'm going on numbers. Okay. Rotticus is a massive language, and I highly doubt that any of those speakers speak Papapana because the Papapana people told me that when they had contact with them I said oh so what language did you speak mm -hmm. together because this was before Top Piston had come along and they said oh well we spoke Rotticus because there was more of them than there were of us so 
Mm. I'm just making an educated guess that the Papapana speakers were multilingual in Rhoticus as well, but the Rhoticus speakers probably didn't speak Papapana. Mm. So I'm assuming that the influence has come from Rhoticus. But it could well have been the opposite direction, you never know. Mm. Well, how does that explain the history of English? Where you majority population of English speakers and a minority of French which is heavily influenced English. Yeah, so. true. So maybe. Well, yeah, exactly. So the French, yes, a minority, but they were, they had power. So that's, mm -hmm. But then in the Papapana community, Rhoticus is seen to be more prestigious because there's more of them. And Papapana is not prestigious because mm -hmm. they're so few in number. They're not because there's so few of them, they're not seen as a powerful group. But I'm guessing that it's not just been to totally peaceful or there's moving around. There have been mm -hmm. power relationships and something. Mm. I don't know what happened when they got to this area here. I know that I think there was some kind of dispute that meant that's why they left the Solomon Islands and moved up. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what happens when, when they actually got here, whether that oh, there was a fight or yeah. what. I, 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 I know from New Caledonia that, that when the French displace some people, um, basically in, in the traditional system, there isn't any spare land. It all, it's all allocated to some town mm. or other. So presumably there must have been some kind of, of conflict regarding any of these. Yeah, I don't system. know, except for the fact that the Rotica speakers are mountain dwellers. So whether they would have been on that stretch of land on the coast, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that. And oh, there's no records. When I was interested in the 500 years thing, I'm not sure where that came from, but it's just generally the, where people tend to uh, put the line of, what, of, of, of colonial influence in terms of language contact. But the reason I was, that I was interested in, in the time scale was whether it's worth looking at, at, at age-related differences, mm -hmm. and whether, uh, um, particularly with regard to the fact that you've got not many kids learning of colour. I mean, that'd be interesting to compare um, um, from a parent time, time study. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be. But I mean, I know, I, I'm, I'm very impressed because for one person, it's, 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 it's a lot of huge amount of work you've done. <laughs> yeah, because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not common to look at all these different, yeah. I just saw Andrew shaking his head when you said 500 family yes. trees. Anagramma <laughs> on top. <laughs> well, because the main purpose of the main th reason I went there was to document the language and write a grammar. Mm. But because I'm so interested in language contact, I just couldn't help myself no. by looking at this other stuff. So my thesis ended up being a grammar with then as much language contact stuff as I could do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was all completely additional. But I think it definitely given there's such interesting things yeah exactly and I can kind of explain them now the earliest materials are which which study this stuff there's a word list from the 60s 1960s 19th I think there's a word list from the 1960s and that's it second generation of scholars doing it. Yeah, there's really not a lot there. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's a shame because once these two boys grow up, they're not going to marry, their brothers, they're not going to marry each other, are they, and pass on the, to their kids. So I think if they are still speaking it when they're older, then the likelihood of them passing it on, I think, is quite slim. Is it, is it, well, how, how does, uh, is, is it kind of patrilineal, manilineal, matrilineal, are, 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 are women supposed to? Um, I don't know actually. I think that kind of well, because now everyone will just speak top piss and they won't learn Papapana. Um, I think it's matrilineal with land and stuff. Yeah, with the land, so it follows that line. Um, but with languages, in terms of which language you're meant to learn when you get married, I don't know because they just will all no one will speak Papapana basically because immigrants come in and I think you know maybe they might have that attitude of what's the point nobody speaks it there's not enough people to speak it with so kind of top pissing has taken over but I know like the previous generation so the lady I stayed with her father spoke something like five languages so they've they've historically been a multilingual community 
And so one of my questions was, was why can't they just add top piss into their repertoire? They, you know, they speak, historically speak all these different languages. Um, but obviously then that gets complicated. They've added that to the repertoire, but because Papa Pan has lost prestige and usefulness, then they've dropped dropping that, um, which is a shame. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Have we still got time? We've got time. Um, so first of all, um, it's, I don't know anything about this area, I'm afraid. So when, when did Top Pissing become a serious lingua franca in this, well, mm, for these quite, guys? Well, it would have, Top Pissing would have sort of come in when the Europeans settled and set up plantations, so that's late 1800s, early 1900s, but as a serious lingua franca, last few decades, I think. Um, I think it varies in different parts of Papua New Guinea, um, but definitely in Bougainville, I think the Bougainville crisis has sped up the process because that meant there was all this displacement, loads of groups of people that might not have had contact before were suddenly placed in these government-run care centres um, where top pissing was dominant. So I think that's massively sped, sped up the process. So um, in part, uh, but in parts of Papua New Independence movement, because there's a huge mine yeah. out there and there was a civil war and the government came in. Yeah, the yeah there's a massive civil war but yeah, over this mine. Um, so I think that has sped up the process in Bougainville. But in different parts of PNG, a top piston is less of a creole, but definitely in Bougainville, I'd say, it's more of a creole because children are growing up speaking that as their first language. OK, thanks very much. And Thank you. Also, I mean, in the same kind of ballpark as a lot of these other questions, I was, I was wondering if you're able to kind of make any kind of educated guess about, in the period, before top pissing was a, mm -hmm. you know, a serious kind of threat, as it were. Um, yeah, well, how do you think the, the contact between, I guess it's mainly between Papapana and Rotticus, how, how, how do you think that was mainly mediated? Um, you know, from what you said, I mean, yeah, do you have... I think, ba well, based... Mm. So when I was looking at all the different family trees and finding out what languages yeah. everyone spoke, it seems like <coughs> the older generation, sort of 40s and 50s upwards, can all speak at least one other local language. Mm. Um, so they're multilingual, and their parents who've died also um, had five languages in the repertoire, that kind of thing. So I think that's how, I think before Top Pissing came along, they were just multilingual in, in Papapana and Rotticus and maybe one or two other local languages, like um, Teot was quite a popular one, uh, maybe in Torau. Um, but, and then also, I mean, Papapana and Torau, for example, are very similar. So sometimes even if you didn't, if some, say if a Papapana person married a Torau person, they might not necessarily have to speak each other's language to be able to understand each other because there's a certain because they're so similar. I think even if you didn't fully get fl fully fluent, you could probably understand. So yeah, I think before Top Pissing came along, it was so just multilingual in the other local languages. Um, and looking at the, sort of looking at which, so I looked at all the speakers that were fluent, but then I also um, recorded which speakers were kind of semi-fluent or had some understand or could partially speak the language and then which speakers kind of had some passive understanding and it's mainly the 30 year olds upwards that speak Papapana fluently and then you get some speakers in their 20s a couple who speak it fluently but not many and so it's probably not really a coincidence that the, the last sort of fluent speakers were born in what, the mid-80s, and that's when the crisis started. Mm -hmm. So basically, the point at which intergenerational transmission was disrupted is the exact point that the Bougainville crisis started. So yeah. I think that's, if you're going to name one factor 
as the most important factor than maybe I could say it's the Bougainville crisis. So, yeah. Thanks. I mean, the, the reason I ask about you know how how it's mediated and stuff is um, you know I'm I'm interested in this question of um, whether kind of different contact scenarios um, are more likely to trigger different types of contact induced change or change in mm -hmm. different domains. Mm -hmm. So there's this idea. You know, like from Van Kootsen and Winford, if you, um, if you have a situation where um, people are, so the agents of change are dominant in the recipient language, right? Which I, which I think is, I mean, it's, it's, it's always an oversimplification, but that seems to be, from what you've said, seems to be likely to be the case here. Like, everyone who spoke Papapano or whatever it was 100, 200 years ago, um, or nearly everyone, w will have learned some of these other languages, mm -hmm. right? But would um, Rotticus speakers who'd been there f since forever, mm -hmm. whose community had, had been there a long time, would they have learned Papapano? No, I don't think they right, Presumably not, right? So, a there'll, couple, there'll maybe. Some of that. Yeah, yeah. Couple. But basically, you're looking at what Van Kooten calls recipient language agentivity, and exactly this kind of abstract morphosyntactic change is what supposedly you don't expect in in that mm -hmm. scenario. But I've never really kind of believed that anyway. So you know, I'd like to. S the trouble is, you can never really be sure about what the agentivity was, but it looks like the agentivity was recipient language agentivity and therefore it looks like another piece of evidence against the idea that when you have abstract syntactic change it, it has to be source language agentivity. Okay. But it's all going to be taken with a kind of mm. pinch of salt. Really. Yeah. And I have one kind of slightly <laughs> frivolous question which is um, do, does it have kind of stress this language similar to English and is in the way they pronounce their language name is stress on the third syllable. And do they always pronounce all three of those paz? Because it seems... Yeah, they do. Papapana. Papapana, and then they stress the third. Papapana. Because, you you know, you'd bet your bottom dollar there'd be a kind of... At least one of those would be haplologized out. <laughs> I want to hear them say it now. Yeah, papapana. that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You can do it, but when you say, yeah, when you say it every day, be Vichanjachara. <laughs> What's that? Aboriginal language in Australia. Vichanjachara. It's not right. a problem. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? <laughs> They have got the word pana and papana, which is reduplicated. Um, papapana isn't. Oh, so it's got some kind of inter it's got some structure to it. No, I don't think oh, it does. Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> no, but that, so I've done some other research recently on reduplication, and papapana has multiple reduplication. So one of the questions that's come up was, is this an example of multiple reduplication where you've got two reduplicants, pa, pa, and then the root, pana. But I can't, no, because pana kind of means side. I think you can have papana, but I don't, I don't know what papapana would be, because when you've got multiple reduplication, it, it expresses habitual aspects, so I don't, it's not used in, it's not used to, yeah, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Yeah, it would be really nice for my talk um, if, on, on reduplication, if Papa Pana was an example of multiple <laughs> reduplication, but I don't think it is. But, but, but because of that, the language is actually full, in practice, of tokens of three identical syllables in a row. Or, yeah. Yeah, okay, well, see, that's that. That explains it, otherwise it would be impossible. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Yeah. 